Okay, thanks very much, Eric. I, I hope everybody can hear me. It's very strange that uh, it took me about 30 years to conceptualize and write this book called Work After Globalization. And I found that it, it resonated with a lot of people, and I, I was invited around the world, and I gave over 50 presentations. And there was one subject on which the, the activists and the students around the world, whether it be Japan, Korea, Brazil, Italy, Germany, or the United States, where the interest really uh, focused. So I decided to take that theme and try and write it as a narrative that was accessible not just to labor economists and labor specialists, but to a wider audience. So that's the origins of, of this book. And it, I've been invited to a large number of presentations already. It's only just come out, and it's the subject quite clearly. And it reminds me of uh, an aphorism of Heraclitus, who said, one never steps into the same river twice. So when you're presenting a book, you're never quite sure which version of the book uh, will come out. So uh, I, I, I don't even know myself what I'm going to be saying, and I hope you will be able to follow the theme. Now the book asks and attempts to answer five questions. What is the precariat? Why care about it? Why is it growing? Who is going into the precariat? And where is it taking us? Now, before I go into the five questions, and I'm going to be very schematic, as you understand the time reasons, and hoping that I will say enough to entice some of you to want to read the book, I want to give two stories, two anecdotes. Um, a few years ago, a gang of youths dressed in cartoon character costumes waltzed into a Hamburg gourmet supermarket and proceeded to take the biggest trolleys they could find and put champagne, caviar, smoked salmon, you, every, every item that they could identify in the, in the carriages and proceeded to take pictures of themselves as they did so. And then they waltzed up to the, the checkout lady and handed her a rose and a note and promptly walked out, not paying it for anything. She rushed to the owner who called the police and the police mobilized 14 police cars to chase this gang. And they obviously were very conspicuous in their funny costumes. And they also mobilized a helicopter, a police helicopter, to fly all over Hamburg to look for this gang. Well, I'm delighted to tell you, they were never caught. Even though they proceeded to hand out the food around in the back streets of Hamburg. And the note that they'd left, said, we are the precarious workers of Hamburg. We produce the wealth of Hamburg, but we don't have any of it. Now, their gang, not surprisingly, has come to become part of the folklore of the European precariat movement, which has been growing, and are called the Robin Hood gang, you know, for obvious reasons. And they are primitive rebels, the sort of primitive rebels that historically have always come in great periods of transformation. Primitive rebels are people who know what they're against, but they do not know yet what they are for. And it's a very specific stage. The second story is an underbelly part of the growth of the precariat. In Prato, which is near where I live, for generations it was an Italian city with garments and, and, and famous for its family firm with labor coming from the south of Italy. And it never had anybody else except Italians. A city of 180,000, and then suddenly, in 1989, a group of 36 Chinese migrants came via Frankfurt and came to Prato and set up a sweatshop. And in the next 15 years, the Chinese migrant sweatshop population of Prato grew to such an extent that they accounted for 40% of the workforce of Prato. And then, of course, the crash came. And whereas the Chinese had been tolerated because they brought in revenue and they contributed, they not made any demands on the state and so on, and traditionally Prato had always been a city of the left, always, year after year, had voted for the left. When the crash arrived, almost overnight, the neo-fascist Northern League wiped the left out, <coughs> took over, 
And Berlusconi, freshly re-elected, lovely man, he said, my first objective is to defeat the army of evil, by which, of course, he meant the undocumented migrants, starting with the Chinese in places like Prato and the Africans in Calabria and, and other places. And the Chinese ambassador rushed up to Prato when they launched these vigilante attacks at night and said it reminded him of the 1930s. Those are two stories which give some flavor of the precariat development. Now what is it, the first question? Well, there are two ways of thinking of the growth of the precariat. One is to think of Weberian ideal types. It's a group that you can identify as a group. And the other is to think of pr a process of precariatization that's taking place that affects large segments of the population. In the next few minutes, I'm going to concentrate on the first type of presentation. But in the book, in both books, I've tried to develop the, the whole process of precariatization rather more fully. Now, the great thing about globalization, and this is something that we observed a lot working in the ILO, as working in developing countries a lot, is that you've got a global class structure that's been taking shape. It may be a little crude, but essentially the class structure has an elite of these abysmally affluent billionaires and multi-billionaires in their criminality at the top, striding the globe. Underneath that you have a salariat with long-term employment security and all the employment trappings of uh, pensions and health insurance and paid holidays and all the rest of it. And alongside that, a growing number of what I call proficients. The proficients are you know, a combination of professionals and technicians who are people who don't have employment security. They're project oriented. They have bundles of skills. They don't want long term employment. They are happy in their independence and their trajectories of being brighter than everybody else. Their only danger is hubris and burnout at the age of 31 and a half. <laughs> but the proficients are a growing number. Underneath the proficients, you have the dying working class. Andre Gorse's death of is probably premature, but it was shrinking and has been shrinking for the last three decades or more, globally. And it's below that that you have this new emerging group of the precariat. And I'll come to that in a minute. Below that, below the precariat, are the unemployed, the long-term unemployed, and a lumpen precariat, an underclass. And I think it's very important analytically and politically to differentiate the precariat from an underclass. There's been a lot of mixing of the two. An underclass is a drag on the accumulation process, whereas the precariat was something that was wanted by global capitalism and is functional to global capitalism. Now, if we try and define the precariat, a point I'm making in the book is that it is a class in the making, not yet a Marxian class for itself, in the sense that there are various insecurities and characteristics of the precariat, but there isn't a common vision of what to do to overcome the precarious existence. And a concept that I found quite useful, that we don't use very much, perhaps you use it a lot in Madison, but I, I, I don't see it used around the world, is the concept of a denizen. A denizen is an old Roman concept, and it was a medieval concept in Britain. It a, refers to someone who has a more limited range of rights than a citizen. So cultural, political, social, economic, the limited rights. And more and more people in societies are actually becoming denizens. But the first characteristic that everybody thinks about when they think about a precariat is that they are insecure in terms of their jobs. They're in and out of jobs, they're in and out of the labor market, they don't have any sense of secure employment, nor do they have a sense of secure income, secure benefits, and all the labor rights that were built up in the 20th century. Those labor rights or labor entitlements, they don't receive. But more importantly, I think, conceptually, is that people in the precariat do not have a, an occupational identity or an occupational narrative which they can give to themselves 
They cannot define themselves for various reasons as being something and on the route to being something. And this is a, a real absence which is very strongly felt. And in the sense that more and more people do not have what Hannah Arendt called a social memory on which to, to call. In other words, a feeling that they belong to a community with ethics and values and traditions and standards which they inherit and reproduce themselves and are expected to reproduce. This lack of a social memory goes with the sense that they need to be opportunistic because the other side of the coin is that the competitive individualistic labor market means that in most cases there's no shadow of the future hanging over their deliberations and exchanges with other people. I meet you today, you meet me today, we'll never meet again. So you can take advantage of me, I can take advantage of you, because we've got no sense of reciprocity or solidarity that you and I expect to need each other uh, later. So this lack of social memory and lack of a shadow of the future produces a sort of very opportunistic, chronically insecure uh, existence. And the final point uh, that I want to make, because it's analytically important, is that there are varieties of precariat. Some people entering the precariat from working class communities, working class families, relatively little education, and they are going into it with certain values, certain fears, and are easily misled by the sirens of populism, and I'll come back to that. In the middle group, the second group, are the people who treat jobs more instrumentally. The migrants who keep their heads down, they don't expect to build a career, but it's relatively good compared with where they're coming from. So they tend to become politically detached, unlike the first group. And the third group consists of young, educated, relatively well-informed people who are suffering from considerable status frustration. And this is the third group, which, which I'm going to come back to later. Now, the second question is why I care about the precariat that's growing in our midst. Well, first of all, obviously, anybody who's in a very precarious set of circumstances is going to be vulnerable to extreme marginalization. They're going to be vulnerable to have one more accident than they've been able to take into account and go in to become bad ladies or the equivalent of men. This sense of being vulnerable to going into an underclass. But there are four A's, the four A's that tend to be characteristic of the precariat subjectively. The first is suffering from a sense of anxiety, chronic anxiety. Globalization has produced economies in which the essential main part is uncertainty. <coughs> Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns, which cannot be insured against. In the old welfare state era, if you had certain contingency risks, at least you could work it out actuarially what social insurance you needed to be able to work out probabilities and you could have benefits. But with our globalized market system, people are suffering essentially from insecurity due to uncertainty, exposure to shocks and difficulty of recovering from them. The second A is they suffer from Durkheimian anomie in the sense that there is a despair of escape. We all know that the channels of social mobility have been uh, reduced and the probability of upward mobility is much lower now than it used to be. This is something that is globally uh, reproduced even though in the United States it seems to have been a bigger drop uh, compared with many other countries. And this anomie is, is, goes together with the development of what I call a precariatized mind. The precariatized mind arises from the fact that if you are living a precarious existence, you cannot afford to concentrate all your efforts on one sort of activity. You have to you have to take account of networking with different groups. You have to spend time learning new skills just in case yours become obsolescent. You have to fill out resumes all the time. You have to constantly flip your attention. And of course, that goes very quickly 
into an attention deficit syndrome. And if there's anybody here who has a recipe for avoiding the development of a precaritized mind, I would, for, I would for one would like to know what the recipe is because you should patent it. Because I think this tendency is affecting many of us. The third, the third A is a sense of alienation. Because increasingly a large proportion of the population are forced to do what they would not like to do and cannot do what they would like to do. A classic recipe for alienation. And they feel underemployed because they're educated or whatever well above what they're forced to have to do and they feel overemployed because of all the pressures on their time that in, in fact makes them feel stressed and suffering from the for various forms of insecurity. And the fourth A of course is anger. Because they see the celebrities, they see the winners, they see the elite, the famous 1% and this induces a stress, an intolerance, and in the book, which was written and published just before the riots in, in, in England, a number of journalists called me up after, afterwards and said, how did you manage to predict what, what has been happening? Because I talk about the likelihood of days of rage and the Euro May Day movement becoming much more pervasive. And of course, this year, we've, we've seen this with the various movements in Tahrir Square, in, in Syntagma Square in Athens, in, in, uh, in Madrid, where I, I've been speaking, and various other places. And now, of course, the Occupy movement, which is the next phase of, of that process. But of course, the precariat has not yet found a sense of agency. They've not found collective voice, but it's rapidly developing, and we'll come back to that at the end. The next question is, why is it being growing? Well, I don't think it's sensible to look for a smoking gun and having you know, a single explanation. And having said that, I'm going to focus on a, a gun and mention a couple of other factors, but I, but I genuinely believe it's a combination of, of circumstances. When globalization took off and the neoliberalism came into vogue, the essence of neoliberalism was competitiveness. Everybody has to be more competitive with everybody else. It's not the old Adam Smith model of exchange economy. It is a competitiveness driven model. And commodification of everything plus a systematic attack on collective agency. Milton Friedman wrote his first book, 1945, where he was actually laid out that that was essential for a market economy. You must dismantle collective agencies. And Hayek had the same perspective. It cannot be seen as a period of deregulation, the globalization area. It was a period of labor market re-regulation. I'll come back to that if, if I have time later. But the essence of globalization was that the liberalization of market economies almost overnight, historically, resulted in the trebling of the world's labor supply. A trebling of the world labor supply where nearly two billion extra workers entered the global market system. And those extra workers were all prepared by historic history to labor for a 30th or a 40th or even a 50th of the wages and benefits of US Europe and so on. And the Faustian bargain that governments made was the following. In liberalization, the benefits to capital, to finance capital, were going to be huge. But there were two things that were going to happen. Either wages and benefits would drop like a stone in the United States and Europe, or a lot of those good jobs would be transferred to Chindia and elsewhere. Neither of those were politically sustainable. And of course, the Faustian bargain essentially was, while wages fall slightly, and while jobs and division of labor change slowly, we will top up declining wages with tax credits and labor, labor subsidies and cheap consumer credit. An orgy of consumption, you pay later. 
Now, of course, the earned income tax credit in the United States became the biggest welfare scheme in the world, and other countries, including my own, introduced their own variants of uh, tax credits. Now, that, of course, could not go on forever. A Faustian bargain always comes to a point where it collapses, and it collapsed in 2007, 2008. And I think it is a mistake analytically to, to blame the bankers and the, I was going to say something else, but the bankers for the crash. Because essentially, it was a system that was established in that period. And the essence of the message was labor market flexibility. I saw this from the inside in the ILO when I first wrote about it in the early 1980s the senior directors of the ILO said, Guy, you're wasting your time. The subject will become passé in a couple of years. And it's still the number one subject. The Greeks are being told to make their labor market more flexible today. The Italians are, the Portuguese are, and so on. And what a flexibility means is three things. One is numerical flexibility. Numerical flexibility means removing employment security. Increasing use of casual labor, temporaries, part-timers, all the rest that we know, outsourcing and all those things, phony independent contractors and stuff that we've, we've seen being analyzed. That erosion of employment security was, was a global phenomenon. But besides numerical flexibility, wage, six, wage system flexibility is something that still we haven't fully got to grips with. Essentially, wage system flexibility meant not just allowing wages, money and real wages to decline, but it meant stripping the social income away from lower, earned, lower earners in the labor market. So systematically, you had an erosion of all those enterprise benefits that had been built up in the laborist period, that had been going to workers and that unions had fought for and so on. Whereas the salariat were gaining more and more of those things, longer paid holidays, more subsidized this, more subsidized that. And so the, though we observe a growth in money wage inequality, as wage differentials were growing because of various reasons we all understand, the actual growth of social income inequality was much greater because those elements that were being taken away from the emerging precariat and were being given in, in, in spades to the salaria were worth a phenomenal part of the total remuneration. Now, in addition to that, you had a reform of the welfare system across the world. And the reform essentially moved away from any idea of beverage and Bismarckian social insurance and so on towards means testing and targeting of benefits on the poor. The poor became a huge concept that too many people use without thinking about the implications. So if you target on the poor, you then say, well, maybe you chose to be poor. You at the back there chose to be poor because you're a lazy bum. Therefore, we have to make a distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And if we do that, of course, we have to introduce not just means tests, but behavior tests. Are those slippers under your bed your slippers or some man who's helping you with your income? Are you really looking for a job, etc.? And the tests multiply. Now, if you have a means tested system, you automatically introduce poverty traps. Poverty traps whereby the precariat, if they're moving from the, from the welfare system benefits into those low-wage jobs that don't have any benefits anymore, they are effectively paying an 80% tax rate. In some countries, it's risen to over 100%. In other words, they earn less by going into a low-paid job than they would get on the benefits. Now, even if you taper it with tax credits, you still find they're facing marginal tax rates over their, their realistic income stream of double what your middle class is paying. Your middle class may be paying 30%, they're paying 
that they don't raise tax rates on the middle class and the elite because, they say, it would act as a disincentive for them working. But the poor, of course, can face double that and are expected to go out and take low-wage jobs. Well, there's a certain irony in that. But what has been happening is that if you introduce all those behavior tests, you introduce a new phenomenon, which I call in the books the precarity trap. Now, the precarity trap works like this. If you lose a low-paying job, you have to start making claims to get some sort of benefit. You are probably less educated than most of us in this room. You are mentally fragile. You've been beaten down. You don't know how to operate in the system. So you apply and you join a queue. You've got the wrong form, sir. Go back. Come back tomorrow. You've got the wrong thing. You answered the wrong question. And it turns out that millions of people, millions of people, are facing a queuing process where they don't actually get any benefits for two or three months. And during which time, their savings are exhausted, they've used up their friends, and they've run up debts. Now, I mentioned this last night to this Occupy group in, in Maine, and the man, man in the middle stood up and he said, you're talking about me. <laughs> now, imagine then what happens. Suddenly, a nice, friendly labor exchange, probably privatized, making a profit out of you, and therefore every person they place in a low-paying job, they get more income themselves, says, the other side of Madison, I found you a possible temporary job paying <coughs> subsistence wage, no benefits, but you should go for it. Now think about it. You're facing an 80% marginal tax rate, your poverty trap, and there you're going, and then you face the possibility that within three weeks you're going to go all the way back and start again applying. This time, having to prove that you didn't voluntarily leave your job. Now millions of people are put in a precarity poverty trap at the bottom of the labor market, and it contributes to this anger that is out there. The third form of flexibility is functional flexibility. And I think it's absolutely important, and too many economists do not make this distinction. The distinction between employment security and job security. Employment security is when you have an employment contract. A job security is when you have a niche that you have feel you control, and you're developing it, and you're going places. <coughs> to give you an example, France Telecom, which is one of the biggest employers in Europe, extraordinarily strong employment security for the vast majority of its workforce. They suddenly found that a whole lot of workers were committing suicide. They had long-term employment contracts, they had good wages and so on, and they couldn't understand why these workers were committing suicide. So they did an investigation and they found that the reason was they'd introduced a job flexibility scheme where every three or four months people were shifted from one part of their place to another and having to learn new bundles of tricks. And the stress of having to adapt was actually terrifying for a large number of people. And I think it's important that job insecurity is something that has been increased enormously in this period. And in this book, I, I analyzed the whole process of occupational dismantling that has taken place in the globalization era. If you think about it, one statistic will give you a picture. In 1980, one in 20 American workers were subject to license for doing their work. They needed a license of some sort. Today, it's more than one in every three. And that's the same in other countries. More and more people must have a certificate, must have qualifications, and therefore be either restricted from practicing their occupation or not. And I could give some, some ridiculous examples of where this applies in this country. But more importantly for my story here is that the regulation has been transferred from inside occupations, the old occupational yields, the professions and crafts, to occupational boards with a mandate to run competitive, consumer-oriented regulations. And it, what has happened, and I won't go into how it's happened, is that they've splintered many forms of occupations. So there are an elite who are allowed to have occupational mobility alongside a group of para 
semi-qualified people who do not have the prospect of going up inside an occupation. And just to give one example there, in my own country, copying American uh, laws as increasingly they do, they got the big ones in 2007, the medical professions and the bar. And they introduced a Legal Services Act. And it's probably being called the Tesco Act. The Tesco is a big chain of supermarkets in Britain. And the reason it's called the Tesco Act is that very soon, and it's already started because it came into effect last month as it happens, you will be able to go into a supermarket and if you want a divorce, you'll be able to go up to a man or a woman with a nice white tunic on and there'll be legal services assistance. And you'll be able to go up and say, I want a divorce. And they'll direct you over there and you'll be told to press the key buttons if you want a no contest divorce, you press one of the buttons, etc., etc. And within two weeks, you'll get your standardized divorce. If you want a will, you'll be able to do the same thing. And of course, it's going to result in a huge number of pe para-legal people who will never become lawyers. It, it, so you're creating a precariatized uh, mass of people. Now, the next aspect is very close to home. And I hope I do not cause offense because I'm sure Madison is the only university that bucks the trend that I'm about to mention, which is educational commodification. In the period of globalization and the neoliberalism, we have seen a systematic transformation of the education system around the world. So we are expected to produce two commodities, degrees and graduates. And if we don't produce them efficiently enough, then we get into all sorts of trouble. We have to process the product and produce people with certificates. I'll give one example. A professor at a university that's quite well known had the audacity to fail two of his students. He was called in by his dean and said, look, you can't fail students. You can have deferred success, but you can't fail them. Why not? They weren't doing any work. Well, if we fail students, it will get out there and will put off other potential students from applying to come to this university. You can't fail them. He said, I'm sorry, but they didn't do any work. They were useless. I'm sorry. He said, go away and think about it over the weekend. Came back on the Monday, called in by the dean, and he said, and? No, I'm sorry, but they still, still failed. Well, I think the vice chancellor would like to see you. You can probably guess the end of the story. He was sacked. He took the university to court. This is a true story. He took the university to court. He won damages, but he never got his job back. Now, the commodification of education and the stripping of the subversive cultural side of tertiary education is a scandal of our age. It really is a scandal of the age. We are expected to produce people with job tickets putting it a bit bluntly, but essentially what is going on. And in that process, we are producing people who are buying a lottery ticket. And increasingly, millions of students around the world know they bought a lottery ticket and a false prospectus. And they come out and they know there are a few winners of the lottery prize, but they're holding a ticket that's worth less and less. And that is producing this incredible growth of status frustration that is taking place. The final factor, which I really hope somebody is going to run with and write a fantastic PhD, and that is we have a tertiarized society, and we haven't yet got an idea of tertiarized time. In industrial capitalism, time was in blocks. You got up in the morning, you went to the factory, you went home, you bed. You went to school if you were lucky for a few years, worked for 30 years, a couple of years retirement, dead. <laughs> it was blocks of time, if you were lucky. But in a tertiary society, we do not have blocks of time. People have to work all the time. They have to combine their labor with various forms of work, that 15% of every year you've got to spend in training, 
20% of your time dealing with your financial affairs, 20% of your time dealing with the bureaucracies that are, are encroaching on your life, etc., etc. And we do not have a sense of control of time and the ability to be in control <coughs> of time. And that is contributing to this precariatized mind, but also, if you think about it for about 32 seconds, you will quickly realize that the precariat has to do a lot more work for labor than any other group in society. A lot more work for state, because they've got to do all those things, those forms. A lot of work for reproduction, because they can't call on expertise, they cannot call on, on help for their, their, their family care and so on. And the inequality of time control is one of the terrible features of the growth of the preparia. I'll stop at that point for that question and then brief, very briefly go into the next one. Who is in the precaria? Well, I two, two ways of answering this question. The first is to say, all of us, except possibly Eric, have a high probability of being in the precaria. It could happen at any time, which none of us should feel smug, because any of us could have an accident, a fall foul, and drift into the precaria. That's one sort of answer. And particularly people who are thinking that their children will be part of the precaria if they are not themselves. But the other answer is to say that, of course, there are certain groups that have a much higher probability of being in the precaria than others. Youth, for reasons I've talked about, anybody who wants to go to China will find that there's a phenomenon called the ant tribe, where millions and millions of educated youth are drifting around desperately trying to survive. It is not just a phenomenon in rich industrialized countries. <coughs> Women obviously comprise a very large percentage of the precariat in various ways. Even though we've just been through what's euphemistically called the great man session, we know that really that the women are being pushed, pushed more into these precariatized jobs that have been spreading. And we have this incredible phenomenon of the bag lady syndrome, where apparently millions of women in various countries wake up at night fearing that they're going to end up in the street living out of a couple of bags. The old ages are making up a growing part of the precariat, and I say in all of these groups, you will find grinners and groaners. The grinners are the people who actually don't mind being part of the precariat for various reasons, like the student who's doing casual jobs, that's no problem. The old ages are doing casual jobs, but there are others who are the groaners, who are desperately insecure, are hanging on. Besides them, there are the disabled. We have a very warped appreciation of the disabled these days. Increasingly, we seem to determine to push them back into low-level jobs, increase the stresses and strains placed on them, including all those suffering from episodic disabilities. And the Supreme Court ruling recently, which I, I read because I just found it so fascinating, whereby that someone who can do three hours of domestic work suddenly becomes capable of therefore taking a labor market job and therefore must be required to go into the labor market. That is a sort of sh gradually shrinking the, the, the boundary of, of disability. You also have welfare claimants and the incredible number of criminalized that our society, and not just here, the number of people who've been criminalized in France, for example, has tripled in the last 15 years. The same in the Netherlands, it's more than doubled in Britain. It's not just a United States experience. Once you've been criminalized, you're not likely to get out of the precariat existence if you're lucky even there to be there. But in addition, of course, the biggest group, the final group, are migrants. Now the migrants are the victims of the precariat. They're also being used as a leverage in the growth of the precariat. They're the light infantry of global capitalism. We have more migrants now than at any time in history, but unlike the period 100 years ago, more and more of the, the total migrant population are circulants rather than settlers. And I just want to mention one particular phenomenon, which is that certain countries have become labor export regimes. China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, a number of others are organizing the mass movement 
of hundreds of thousands of workers, including hundreds of thousands of convicts, to go on short-term projects on dam building, road building, various other, other, other activities on short-term contracts if they're lucky. Of course, as one uh, manage, Chinese manager that I quoted in the book says, they're relatively easy to manage. Well, if you're managing prisoners, no wonder. But don't think that it's only happening in developing countries. It's happening in the United States, it's happening in Europe. The Greek government, in order to get some help from the Chinese government with their bonds, agreed to allow the Chinese to bring in Chinese workers to work in their ports. The, po the Polish government recently put out to tender their highway system, and it was won the tender by a Chinese state corporation bringing in Chinese workers, subsidized by the European Union. So I, as a Br British taxpayer, am subsidized so that the Chinese could come in and work on building the, po the Polish roads. But a lot of people in Britain who don't think that's particularly fair, I don't understand them, but there you are. Now, there was a poem <coughs> seen on the door of one of these dormitories of this large mass of Chinese migrants. And they've been seen in many places that you wouldn't expect, including the nirvana of social democracy, Sweden. And the poem on the door said, we are all floating around in the world. We meet each other, but we never really get to know each other. And that seemed to me a classic precariat poem that was very, very poignant. That leads me to the last question. Now, I, I'm inclined to say I'll just do half of it and then hope that, that you will want to read the book to read the other half. But I think that's a bit unfair, so let me briefly go through both halves. The final two chapters are where is the precariat taking us? First one, the prospects of a politics of inferno. And the second one, with a due apology to Dante, of course, is a politics of paradise. Now the politics of inferno goes something like this. We have societies of denizens. We have these yawning inequalities that are not addressed. The access to the key assets of a tertiary society are gradually whittled away. Time, the commons, public space, knowledge, all those things are denied to the precariat. <coughs> and you have the growth of the panopticon state. The panopticon state is something that is growing everywhere. And the surveillance and the data surveillance and the profiling is so reminiscent of the panopticon that it's almost palpable that you get leading social thinkers who are using the language of Bentham and the panopticon in their policy books. And the language, of course, is the book Nudge. Everybody knows that book. I'm sure it's widely read and discussed. And if you read it and you look at it, it's one of those books that I advise people to read if they want to keep their bath water hot in the evening. Because it should keep your blood pressure up and it'll keep the water warm. Now the essence of nudge is libertarian paternalism. <clears throat> and it is saying you lot out there are suffering from an excess of information and you cannot make rational judgments. And therefore must be nudged to make the right choice. Now this is so utilitarian. And the utilitarian ethos is the dominant one, which is why they can demonize a minority. The greatest happiness of the good allows you to punish and take away benefits from the minority. Very consistent with the panopticon. But at the same time, this state paternalism, this libertarian paternalism, is gone to the point where when Barack Obama was elected, one of the first things he did was appoint as chief regulator in the United States, one of the co-authors of that book. And when David Cameron was elected Prime Minister in Britain, one of the first things he did was appoint his, the other co-author as advisor in Downing Street and setting up a behavioral insight team 
which was quickly dubbed the Nudge Unit, <laughs> and the Deputy Prime Minister was sagacious enough to say that this unit is designed to make everybody make the right choice. Now think where that leads. Now we have a situation where we have the development of the panopticon state and the insecurities of the precariat, but the worst thing about the politics of Inferno is the drift to a neo-fascist populism. The neo-fascist populists play on the fears of that first variety of the precariat and a lot of people who are fearful of falling into the precariat. Berlusconi in Italy was a classic in the sense he knew where he should place his appeal to the electorate. He played on the fears of the domestic precariat against the migrants, that part of the precariat. And it's very interesting that we have the most vibrant precariat movement now in Italy. And I was in Milan, we had a wonderful election week, just the last election, where his candidate, and he comes from, from Milan, was beaten by the precariat candidate, which was a real harbinger and a, a, a lifted the spirit. But the neo-fascist populism is growing all over Europe. Your Tea Party, the fanatical right, we listen to your candidates on the Republican side and we cannot understand how anybody can take them seriously. But don't worry, we have our equivalents in Europe. And they're gaining in charisma, they're gaining in their buzzwords. Marine Le Pen has a good chance of doing very well in the French presidential election next year. And the far right is making huge strides in Sweden, in Finland, in Germany, in, a, in all over Europe. It is something that is really a crisis. And the only reason for being optimistic is that more and more people in the center, the political center, are becoming aware that they are losing out because their old social democratic message doesn't resonate with the precariat. It's not selling. They're losing votes everywhere. And at the same time, they see this drift to the far right. So suddenly, People like me are getting invited to their congresses to speak. And last week I was in Westminster talking with Labour leaders, whereas five years ago they would probably wouldn't have been given me the time of day. And next week I'm doing it in, in Belgium and the Netherlands. And that's because they are scared. The Social Democrat groups are scared. And that leads to the last point, which is the politics of paradise is emerging in the squares gradually this primitive rebel phase is giving way to a set of demands and the set of demands are crystallizing around the great trinity of the enlightenment we want more equality we want more freedom including associational freedom that has been eroded in the globalization era and we want more fraternity in communities that function and have a voice for the precariat inside them. And they aren't just subjects of policy. And that is turning, I think, to greater consideration of things that a few years ago would have been laughed at, including a basic income, a universal, unconditional, individual basic income. A growing number of people and a growing number of political parties are taking up the cudgels of this. They're also talking about capital funds for financing and shifting away from subsidies to be able to afford a basic income. And the greatest experiments that we've seen <coughs> include what's happened in Brazil. <coughs> when I first went and talked about basic income in Brazil in the mid-90s, we were given short shrift and we were laughed at. Then later on in the 90s, invited back, and certain mayors were bravely introducing a bolsa escolar for women with children, as long as they sent their children to school. When Lula was elected, he was a bit skeptical, had to be persuaded to go national with the bolsa familia, 
Today, more than 50 million Brazilians receive a monthly cash transfer, in effect, a basic income. And when we had our Congress, our Bien Congress, last year in July in Sao Paulo, Lula took the time to spend an hour and a half talking with a small group of us about it. And he told me bluntly, he said, I know I was only re-elected president because of this policy. But he was brave and he's done it, and now other Latin American countries are doing it. In India, where I'm going after this, this trip, we are doing a pilot where a whole lot of areas, we are doing a two-year pilot where everybody in the villages individually is getting a basic income cash transfer. And five years ago, the government would have somehow stopped us doing that. This time, we're getting from the Prime Minister's office, the Planning Commission, quiet support. Any, need, any help you need, do it. And you're seeing in Europe a growing awareness and willingness to discuss this. Now, there are other policies for improving security, improving control over time, improving the voice of the precariat in social agencies, in occupational agencies. And I hope that you will want to look at that in the book. But I want to end with one particular idea that I've put in the book, which is that we are suffering from a deliberative democracy deficit. We all see the commodification of politics. We all see the thinning of democracy. And we need to strengthen deliberative democracy. When I was last here with Eric, we spent three days, I think it was three days, talking about the various options. And I believe that it would be very valuable if in introducing a basic income, and it may be called something quite different in order to be sold by the politicians, stabilization grants or whatever you want to call them, when we had stabilization sharing grants, that we attach a moral condition when people sign up to receive that stabilization grant, they make a moral commitment to not only vote in national elections, but to participate in a deliberative democracy day once a year, and participate and listen to various points of view on key policies in a town hall or a village hall or so on. And there are historical precedents. Read Tom Paine again, and you see how in the early stages of the United States, round the fireside, people deliberated. And de Tocqueville marveled at how that was part of the democracy in America. And, of course, there's a much earlier precedent. In ancient Athens, in 403 BC, they had a system whereby all the citizens, and there were many things wrong in that society, we know that, but all the citizens were given a basic grant which was essentially a payment for them being publicly involved in the life of the police. Now, it's a policy that I think could fly given the decline of democracy, but it would only be a moral condition attached to basic income. I'll stop there, and thank you very much for listening, and hope you'll find it of interest. Thank you. Most or something like the, the mass mobilized by Nazi or Mussolini in Italy. You see, so? I think one at a time. One at a time? Yeah, just. Uh, no, no. It's, it's definitely not a lumpen pro proletariat. Mm. It's definitely not an underclass. Mm. Okay? I, I talk about a lumpen precariat. Mm. The difference is that people who've gone into an underclass are really socially ill, they are, they are destroyed as people. They're drug addicts, they're people that have drifted outside the system. The precariat is a body of workers of a type that is wanted. And they're also not a proto-proletariat. They're not in the process of becoming a new proletariat. They're always going to be the labor market insecurities, the flexibility and so on. And, uh, they're, they're not, they're, they're something quite separate from a lumpenized group. In Brazil, um, where people now get uh, a basic income, is that enough for them to pay their rent and have clothes and buy their groceries? Yeah, um, in Brazil, and there's been a lot of research done, 
on the Bolsa uh, Familia and the preceding Bolsa Escolar. And, and it's shown a number of very exciting uh, developments. Now, before I answer, we also did a pilot in Africa for two years in certain villages where we introduced an unconditional basic income cash transfer in villages. And the IMF tried to get it stopped. But what actually happened in those villages and what's been happening in Brazil, they're remarkably similar. And what we're seeing in India, remarkably similar. What happened was that, in particular, child's nutrition improved because they were able to spend the money on improving food. Child school attendance went up. Child school performance improved. Women's economic status improved. Women's capacity to take economic activities and develop them independently improved. People started going to the clinics. So the people with the HIV AIDS, this was a major thing in, in the African case where one in five had HIV in these villages we were doing it, they suddenly started taking the antiretrovirals because they'd been able to take enough food from their, their cash transfer so that they were able to keep down the medicine. And finally, economic crime has gone down. Now you find in Brazil, the same sort of phenomenon has followed from the introduction of this scheme. And it is remarkable, so not only that, you've seen economic growth increase, because to start with, they said if you spend all this money like that, growth will go down. And you see inequality has been reduced a lot. Uh, one question here and then I'll... Yeah, um, I have more like a conceptual question. Uh, why do you think uh, this is a new class um, and not just a, like a strata within the old working class? Well, that's, that's the stand... If I, may, I mean, that's the question I knew would, would come up when I was writing the book. And it really took me a lot of time to say, do I give it this subtitle because I know I'm putting out a, 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 a red flag to my Marxist friends. The, <laughs> the reason it's not part of the old proletariat is that the proletariat was fighting for a laborist future. It wanted full employment, which meant male full employment. It was very sexist. It was treating the breadwinner, the male, family, women, outside, dependent, and access to social security, which was laborist. Laborist, if you performed labor, you know, it was taken to extreme in the Soviet system, but all that whole Marxist tradition went with that. The proletariat was meant to be in stable, subordinated labor. It made a social compact with capital, whereby you got your labor security, in return, you obeyed the boss. That's essentially the model. So it was a model for subordination. And the, 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 the laboring unions, who are not liked, incidentally, by the precariat, they do not identify themselves with labor trade unions. It's, very, you know, it's a very striking feature. The precariat is not only not having an occupational identity like many of the craftspeople who formed the labor unions to start with did. It's, not, it's suffering from chronic insecurity and is expected to be infinitely flexible. And it is expected to do a very large proportion of work for labor out of the total. Whereas in your old laborist pr proletariat model, you were kept ignorant you went to the factory, you did what you were told, you went home and you do dropped to sleep, and if you had some food you went back after beating up your wife or whatever because you were taking out the stresses on your family. That was a model that was industrial capitalism. And I think the third reason why I think it's useful to use different language is we need to, we need to engage with new concepts. And if you use the old terminology, and the old things, you lose the capacity to analyze quite profoundly different developments in the labor process. Right. I'm wondering about the intentional re reconstruction of the military employment system so as to create a precariat. I'm thinking, for example, of all the outsourcing that's going on, the contractors, the mercenaries, and all of that. 
uh, many of whom are ex-criminals uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, people from uh, war-torn nations, whatever, who are looking for uh, paid employment. And I'm wondering, uh, again, um, uh, how you feel that it, that it will affect the military. I'm not for a standing army and all of that, but uh, it is quite frightening to have so many people in a precarious situation. Well, I mean, the, the classic case is, is Shenzhen. Now, Shenzhen is called the industrial workshop of the world. And there are something like a million Chinese workers in Shenzhen, all in these militarized factories. And they use all the latest technology, which they have for surveillance and control systems. And most of the technology has come from the US military. <laughs> They, they, they brought it in and then are refining it for uh, Chinese conditions. Now, I've been to Shenzhen and it is, is a frightening panopticon zone. And literally, these workers are in chronic hatches. And earlier this year, some of them were committing suicide. So the response of the management uh, was to put up nets around these big buildings to sort of save them when they jumped out of the windows. And, and one of the Silicon Valley tycoons had, had the temerity to say how shocking the situation was. Well, of course, who were the people buying up all these goods that were being produced in Shenzhen? But the Silicon Valley billionaires. And these prisoners, these militarized prisoners in Shenzhen, and without their hukus, without their license, so that that doesn't give them any entitlements, are, are the cutting edge of the world's precariat. They've leveraged a lot of changes elsewhere. One comment. In the US, of course, workers have been, haven't had the kind of job security that you're familiar with in yeah, Europe. Uh, that is, workers have been fired. You know, there weren't lifetime contracts for ordinary workers. There was a very brief period that we're talking in the United States where there was anything remotely like secure labor contracts for still even in the US, even in the heyday of the post-World War II period for a small part of uh, what would normally be called working class uh, employment. So one view would be that it's a characteristic of capitalism from the start to want vulnerable, precarious, easily fired, wage-flexible labor force. There was a brief period in the 20th century where the precariat became less central to capitalism and that we're now going back to a more characteristic form of capitalism, and which is it's not surprising in the globalization context for the reasons you said. This massive increase in the labor market the, on a global scale of labor supply which was the characteristic of earlier forms of capitalism, a large relative surplus population, um, high unemployment as the characteristic form of capitalism. So maybe the 20th century is just a deviant few decades. In the middle of the 20th century, we're just re returning to vulnerability and precariousness as the chronic condition of employment in a in a right. of capitalism. Well, the, the reason I reacted initially to your initial remark is that I clearly wasted my time making the distinction between yeah. employment security and job security. Because you talk, when you said job security, you were talking about yeah. employment, employment security. security. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the point is, of course, that, that in industrial capitalism, you had pro, a process of proletarianization. You know, beautifully analyzed by people like E.P. Thompson, where the discipline of the clock and the discipline of the calendar and, the, and the, the working day became the focus. It was a period also of job demarcation, where the unions fought for job security, even though they didn't have much employment security. So you had all those unions, the craft unions, and the, the split in the AFL-CIO in those early years. So even in the United States, you had advances on various forms of, of labor security in this period. And it was part of the working class struggle to provide greater forms of labor security, more predictable wages, more access to benefits, more skill security. So they had craft communities, they had those traditions which were preserved to a certain extent. They came from pre-capitalist eras. 
Now we have a situation where all those forms of labor security that were fought for by the working class, the industrial working class, have been stripped away from the precariat. There wasn't a precariat as such. There was a proto-proletariat, in, in the sense I, I was talking about before, who underwent a process of proletarianization. The reason I, I used Polanyi in this book, The Great Transformation, is that it was a process of proletarianization that took place as national markets were forged. National labor markets, national markets. <coughs> Here we have a global transformation where we have international markets. So for example, a, a person may enter an occupation but there will be no avenues of upward mobility in the occupation because the middle ranks have all been outsourced to Bangalore. But that was true in the United States and then for most workers in the 19th century as well. There's no chance for mobility. I mean, it's a no, but, the, but, that, that but it was the development of national markets where people were either proletarianized or semi-proletarianized by having a, a access to land and so on. And it was not a case where you had this infinite flexibility and adaptability that was being pushed on the precariat. And this, this, in that process, there was a process of proletarianization. More and more people were being sucked into stable labor, and you had the whole problem. But that's the, the part, that's the part that I don't think is a correct description of 19th century capitalism, stable labor. They were no, constantly wasn't. losing their jobs. They were, of course. Of course. They were downward. Uh, they had complete flexibility in labor markets for uh, wage wage movements downwards and upwards. But th that period was not a period in which you deliberately set out governments to set out a precariat as a central part of your production system. There was a gradual process which went on for decades as more people were brought off the land into increasingly stabilized, that's subordinated labor. And now this, they don't want stable subordinated labor. They want a precariat a type of workforce. But I think your last comment really underscores. I, I, this is really interesting, but Polanyi's argument is about the way the state intervenes in markets to provide citizens with social security. And I'm struck by, in your emphasis on the precariat as a class formation, you don't talk at all about the way states have been reconstructed and withdraw the kind of supports that. And in fact, all of your, um, the, the, when you talk about the most vulnerable groups of the precariat, and also in your solution in the, um, the heavenly, whatever the paradise thing, it's the role of the state in providing rights to citizens Absolutely. that prevents there from being the precariat. And yet, somehow the state isn't part of your description of what forms the precariat, even though it's central. No, I think the state is central. And, the, and, and in the last chapter I say the state must become much more active in enforcing rights and including setting up national wealth funds and, 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 and doing. I don't think the state has withdrawn national capital funds, which are you know, places like uh, Norway have these and, and so on. Now, the, the, the Polanian thing, of course, re-embedding the economy in society is what it's all about now. That, that's, that's what I'll say that, about Polanyi. And I was very pleased that, that uh, his daughter endorsed the book, actually. So, so I, I do think the state is central to this, this whole thesis. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, I think you may under, be underestimating the role of military creaking empire in 65 years of that in the United States. Have you read the book um, Spirit Level by uh, of course. Richard, Richard Wilkinson and so forth? Because because he finds that income inequality is, is worst here in the United States, and, and, and on my own charts, uh, 14 out of 15, 16, uh, we're the worst in the world, and many of those things. And in my own correlations with uh, military spending are much stronger than theirs are. So I think it's the empire and the, the decaying and the driving out of uh, manufacturing that, that the empire brings about by taking away scientists, engineers, and capital from the, the industrial sector, and, it, and then you, you brought about that brings about all the collapse of, uh, uh, of the manufacturing sector with about a half life of 30 years uh, in, in America from 50 to 80 to, to 10, uh, for instance, and 
And so I, I see that as a much stronger shadow uh, shaping this whole structure. And it comes from the United States, principally. Uh, not in the third world environment is what we're shaping ourselves into. I, I see uh, empire uh, traits, a kind of a, a middle ages uh, lords and serfs uh, where, where the church is dominant and science is not. And uh, I see that whole evolution being a part of uh, empire. I'm not sure I'm capable of answering your, your, your particular comment. But I have read, of course, and dialogue uh, talk about spirit with level, about right? spirit I'd level. I'd like to hear your comments on that. This, it's called The Spirit Level, and it's, it's, a, it's a good book. And basically what it says is that inequality is associated with a whole lot of social ills. Right. Well, I would have thought that we'd accepted that a long time ago. But it does it very elegantly with a lot of statistics, and, and it's been quite influential. And, and uh, I've dialogued with them about the precariat, and they've come to various meetings on the precariat. I, I don't know about the, the relevance of your military uh, side, beyond the, saying that clearly the technologies of the military are being used as control systems in this process. And, and I think the indirect controls that are part of the modern labor process are very fundamentally different from uh, the, the Ford model of the early 20th century and even the model of the, the, the 19th century. So I, I think that the technology is playing a part, but apart from that, um, I'm not quite sure what to say about well, it. Did you note that the first of your four A's, anxiety, is linear, linearly increasing in America? from the 50s through the 90s, that, that the anxiety level of the average college student yeah, in, in, in the 90s at, at, is like that of a, a child in therapy in the 50s. No, anxiety is a globally <coughs> growing phenomenon. The, 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 the enormous amount of data uh, demonstrates that. And it is associated with this chronic insecurity that is characteristic of, of modern market economies. And I would argue that's the shadow of empire worldwide. Um, Possibly. As I was thinking about your analysis, it struck me that what you're talking about, in a sense, is a response to the revolutions we've seen in communication and transportation, the globalization of resources, markets, finance, capital, which are really demanding um, a kind of global perspective on the marketplace and demanding a high level of flexibility uh, because jobs, capital, sources of products can shift so rapidly. If wages go up in China, it'll shift elsewhere to low wage uh, com companies. So that um, I see what you're talking about more in that response to those revolutions and transportation, communications, the development of the internet, uh, as opposed to um, some kind of internal development within countries. Uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fully understand the, the way you're coming from. I, I think we're in the midst of a global transformation in, in the Polanyan sense in the sense that we are seeing the development of international markets. And international markets require different systems of regulations and, and different mechanisms of social protections than if you had national markets. That, that, is, that is very clear. And I think this demand for flexibility and demand for, for people to be insecure is part of the labor market that is wanted, the modal drift of the international labor market. And I think that it's, we have to accept that there is going to be no return of decent wages for a large proportion of the American workforce or the European workforce. It's, it's a fool's errand if we think that through collective bargaining we're going to manage to push wages up again for the next foreseeable two, three decades. As you say, you know, if, if Chindia suddenly became exhausted of its labor supply, which is very unlikely, 
its wages are still a tiny fraction of, of uh, the United States or Europe, it's not going to happen. And, and I think that the, the whole laborist agenda of trying to do it through jobs, jobs, jobs it, 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 it's, it's not going to work. Which means that if we want a reduction of inequality, we're going to have to find alternative ways of redistributing income. And that means getting access to financial capital in particular, which is why it's so exciting the growth of national capital funds. The Alaska Permanent Fund was, a, was an early precursor, the Norwegian one, and you've got strange experiments taking place in other countries where no less than 40 countries have these national capital funds. And potentially they're able to distribute uh, to the population in different ways. In other words, we have to have access to the increasing returns to capital that are going to financial capital. Does the precariat in an existence long enough to have had kids so that we can ask questions about what it's like growing up under that for kids, and in particular, the impact on their relationship to schooling? It, it, there are some. I, I, I gave a talk in Rome uh, recently, and a whole lot of people who identified themselves as the precariat came in this big hall, and they asked me to, to go to the squatter camp, and they'd taken over a, a military barracks. They'd taken over a military barracks, a thousand of them about, and I spend the whole day talking, and there are second generation people. So that the interesting thing is that they don't have traditions, working class traditions of their parents. And they tend to be uh, particularly angry and insecure. And, and we don't know, we haven't seen enough research on it. But certainly the anecdotal evidence is that the second generation don't have any roots. They don't have an occupational community background that I was mentioning earlier. So that the, the precariat induces a different perspective. I mean, this is a, more a hypothesis than, than shown by, by good research. But I think that's part of the exciting thing about its development, because there's so much research that's needed. But definitely, you see the precariat breaking up into factions. Some actually want to be part of a precarity. If they don't see themselves entirely as victims, they do not want to go back to a proletarianized past. They are rejecting that laborist agenda. And that is quite quite a, a good development, I think. I see something happening in the state of Wisconsin because we have a salarian class that was standing up to our governor last spring. And I mean, they know they might lose their pensions, they know they might lose their jobs, a lot of state workers. Are you aware of what was happening here with the bargaining? I've heard, I've heard some of the stories. Uh, mm -hmm. The precariat is alive and well here, it's just not that they're very local. And my question is, how do you relate anxiety and fear to the precariat? Um, I don't see that necessarily in what I, in Wisconsin as a precarious class. They accept it, not in terms of resignation, but at some level, it is the alert place to be. Hmm. It's the alert place to be. Yeah, it doesn't I mean, matter that there isn't an answer. Yeah, I, 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 I fully agree, and I'm glad you said that, because it, it is something that's very, very tangible when you're having big meetings, quite a lot of the people actually welcome being part of the precariat. I, all the insecurities they know about, a lot of people are not, not welcoming, they are the victims. But there are a lot of people who are actually setting out, you know, you might call them idealistic or bohemian or whatever, but there's definitely a feeling we do not want to go back to a laborist model. We want to have autonomy, we want to be able to work, we want to be able to work on our passions and our interests. And it is work, it is work. And we have to get away from, from our terrible labor statistics where we, we, we don't count work that isn't labor. And that's a classic demand of the precariat because 
All the work that women do, all the work that a lot of other people do, are just ignored in our labour statistics. And I don't see politicians or distinguished social scientists demanding that we should have more revealing statistics on the work that is done in society. So we have a completely distorted orientation, which is just focused on labour. And, and it, it's a sad statement. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, you. Can. I'm just uh, wondering that the idea of migrants being the largest, but also maybe politically uninvolved group of the precariat, and yes, I mean migration scale may have increased, but the phenomenon is certainly not new. Um, so, what exactly is you know new or of interest that we might gain from this? Um. I think there are a number of things, partly the scale, partly the nature of migration. Increasing numbers of people are moving uh, uh, in circular migration rather than as settlers. And this mass movement that is taking place, which even though there were in the past there were things like the Filipina maids that were coming abroad and sending back remittances, there's never in history been a, a, a mass movement of hundreds of thousands of people for short-term projects uh, as part of a multinational labor process. This is something that is, I, maybe Eric knows of some 19th century president, but I mean it is something that is very fundamental to the global market, labor market that's developing. Now I think that is part of it, but when I said earlier that the varieties are precarious and that the migrants tend to be instrumental, doesn't mean that all of them are like that. I mean, a large number of migrants are joining the, pro the progressive path. They are, they are, if you go to a precariat meeting and go to the previous question, you will find quite a lot of migrants, quite a lot of gays, quite a lot of uh, uh, non-conformist types that are contributing to the growth of the precariat movement. And they are demanding a different type of, of politics. Uh, which is which is quite exciting. So I, I want to correct the impression that I think all the migrants are in that middle part. It's 5:30, so I think we should wrap this up. Um, thank you so much.